Well, I've got something a little bit different for you today. And my local shire invited me to come and talk about my passion, the Agile Antichinus, on a webinar. So my first time ever speaking live to an audience over the internet. Uh, so I made a presentation first, and then after that, I answered questions. And I didn't perform as well as I'd have really have liked to, but anyway, here it is, warts and all. Hi, I'm Derek Hilton, and welcome to my beautiful office, which is a reasonable sized reserve nestled in the Dandenong Ranges. Now the Shire of Yarra Ranges have invited me to come and talk to you about my passion the Agile Antichinus. Now, that's a small carnivorous marsupial. Now I've been studying them for the past 10 years in this reserve. So I have a lot of information that I'd love to share with you today. Now it'll take me five hours to tell you everything that I've learned. So we're going to condense that down, give you a good idea, a good understanding about how they live their lives and how they interact with each other. I'm going to start with why they're called the Agile. How did they get their name? If you watch them climb a tree, because they're a tree climber, you'll soon work out exactly why they're called that. Very agile, very nimble when they're getting around trees. And I've actually seen a couple jump from one tree to another over a metre. So for a small marsupial that's just a little bit bigger than a mouse, to be able to do that with such confidence is an amazing experience to watch. You wouldn't think something that small would attempt that from a, a height of 12 metres or more, but they do. They live in hollows in trees as well. It's one of their favourite places to nest, and they will nest logs on the ground as well but they much prefer to nest in an upright tree. And one of their favorite trees is the silver wattle. In this reserve, it is most favored by them. And it's the main tree that I see them climbing as well. They are an insect eater. They love beetles, moths, and a gourmet meal for them are witchy grubs. They just can't get enough of them. They're in heaven when they come across them. So there's lots to be found on the silver wattle. So they have a bit of a relationship in this reserve anyway, with the silver wattle. So the silver wattle will benefit from them because they help to keep the insect population down, helps to keep them healthy. And in return, the agile has a nice safe place to live and get a feed at the same time. When it comes to the agile social behavior, they're very much the individual, self-reliant, with strong personalities. They have no social network or any understanding of working together for mutual benefit. But they do, however, have a social order. The more aggressive you are, the higher up the order you are. The most aggressive female will dominate the area that she lives in. She will constantly chase her rivals away from where she is hunting for food. But if they don't move on, she will fight them. This behaviour continues when females start a communal nesting site. The more aggressive female will control who sleeps in the nest and who is not welcome. For those females that are rejected, they will be forced to climb to the top of the hollow where they will huddle up with less fortunate females to sleep. Otherwise, they will have to find a nesting site that is more suited to their social order. Numbers will vary in each nesting hollow, from 20 one day, eight the next, as each female looks for a suitable place to sleep. Some sites will be made up of juvenile females, and others will be made up of older females, and some juvenile females will join their mothers. As the agile forages for food in the undergrowth, ticks attach themselves to the Agile, and they look like pearl jewellery hanging from their ears and their necks. Although they don't seem to bother the Agile at all, but what does bother the Agile are ants. They can't stand them touching them. 
It drives them crazy. One in five females engage in the most unusual behaviour. They put their tails in the air and wiggle their hips. And they mainly do this when they first come out of the hollows. And those that do engage in this odd behaviour do so for life. They could be scent marking the area as a way of communicating with other agiles. I simply don't know. But it's one of the funniest things that agiles do and it really has me baffled. Like the females, males have the same social order, but with a twist. Some males will tolerate another male. A male I called Arnie was a dominant male in his area, and he was substantially bigger than all the other males. When he arrived on the scene, other males would quickly disappear to avoid any conflict. But one male would hang around in the background, watching what Arnie was up to. And that was Dave. He was the second most aggressive male in the area, and the only male that Arnie would tolerate being around, as long as he knew his place. While the males are out hunting for insects, they like to regularly drop in on the females while they're in their communal nesting sites, just to make themselves known to the females so that they may be chosen as a partner for mating when breeding season comes around. For the males, breeding season will be a dramatic end to their lives. When their bodies switch to breeding mode, there is no turning back. As chemicals flood their bodies, spurring them on to mate with as many females as they possibly can before time runs out. Eventually the high levels of testosterone and other chemicals are just too much for their bodies and they start to hemorrhage internally. Their back legs give out first then the rest of the body organs soon follow. Now I've been using two tools that have been vital to my learning about the Agile Antichinus. Without it I don't even know half the story. That is two nesting boxes and two trail cameras. So this little fella here has been watching what's going on in those nesting boxes 24 hours a day, seven days a week, year after year. And what I've discovered has just been amazing. Now I am a self-taught naturalist and I know that I have to get my information accurate. And they've allowed me to do this because I can consistently see females bringing up their young year after year, not in just in one spot, but in two spots. So I've been able to be very accurate and um, have a good understanding about what I'm saying. And the information that I've gathered is accurate. Now the story behind nesting box number one was I built it for a particular female that I call Possum. I've been watching her the year before, bringing up her young in a hollow very close to where I'd put the nesting box. And I was very lucky that she took it up. Now her sight was looking very ragged, so I thought I had a really good chance that she would take up mine. Because females will come back to the same site year after year, as long as it still suits them. You know, everything's okay, that the weather isn't getting in, and things like that. So within hours of me putting that nesting box up, she took it up. So I was very grateful and it was amazing getting information within hours of me putting that nesting box up. I got to learn how she would consistently bring up her young and what time of the year the joeys come out of the nest and what time they leave the nesting hollow. So in Possum's second year, She'd finished, she'd gone off into her communal nest and her joeys had dispersed and then all of a sudden it became a female communal nest. Now there's something that I thought that I would never get to witness but I was always hopeful that it had happened. And this is the 
pinnacle of me studying the Agile Antichinus, and that is the breeding behavior. So this camera right here recorded four mating events. It just <laughs> blew my mind when I came to check the camera one Saturday morning. There it was. How they go about mating. So the males would come and visit the females and the females would come and visit the males because it was a particular male took up residence. He got in while the females were out and he slept there for a few nights and the females would come to him. So just amazing what I have learnt. It's just been unbelievable. Now nesting box number two was a totally different story. There's always the exception to the rule with birds or any other animal. And Sandy was one of those females that did things differently than the others. Now she was a terrific mother, so much so that she interacted with her joeys once they started coming out of the home nesting site, where the other females, like possum, would have no part in them at all. So once they start coming out of the nesting hollow and getting their own food, females would leave them to their own devices. They wouldn't come back and check on them or anything. But with Sandy, she stayed around for two weeks, interacting with them outside and coming back inside the nesting hollow, check up on them, make sure everything's all right, and then she'd leave. And she'd do that about four times a day and through the night as well. So these have just been amazing tools to use and without them, definitely wouldn't know much about the Agile's life at all. Well, that's the end of my little presentation. We'll continue our talk live. So Jen, over to you. Thank you so much, Derek. Uh, I hope everyone really loved that. As I said, absolutely amazing footage, beautiful photographs, and really, really wonderful to get that intrinsic look at uh, the life of the Agile Antichinus. Um, so I'd like to welcome Derek to come and join us now. So uh, hopefully he can uh, jump in. Uh, we It's been so beautiful to be able to uh, get the footage and uh, get Derek to be out there and capturing all of that. Uh, one thing we will just say is we're actually not going to say what reserve that, uh, that that footage was taken from because uh, we just don't really want to have hundreds of people going out there over the next few weeks and trying to find and stalk the Antichinus as well. But I think Derek, you'll agree with me that these uh, these sort of beautiful creatures and any kind of wonderful native animal, if you stay, stay quiet long enough and study them and enjoy your reserve in a patient way, you will get to sort of see this and they'll get used to you, I presume. You certainly will. Um, yeah, with with the Agile especially, um, I'd walk into the reserve once I'd worked out how to find them and uh, consistently see them coming out of their nesting hollows, things like that, um, that I, I would turn up and I'm a little bit, you know, flustered. And I'd have to uh, try and calm myself down. So I had, I started building up a technique of walking into the reserve about 70 meters. And then I would uh, just listen, listen to the birds. And that, that would really help me switch off from the outside world uh, and tune into nature much better and be more, much more relaxed. So as I, come up to the Agile's nesting sites. Um, I'm much calmer and yeah, much more relaxed. So I'd encourage everybody to do that. As you walk into the reserves or forest, just stop for a minute. Just listen to birds and it'll help you to tune in. So uh, it's been amazing experience studying the Agile. I originally, was very much into birds, watching them build their nests um, and how they went about bringing up their young and things like that. And when the Agile popped out onto a track in front of me, I was, it you know, just captivate, captivated me from the start. I had no idea what it was. Like most Australians, it just seems to be one of those animals that no one talks about. It's just out of the scene. So jumping online after I'd had this little <laughs> meeting with this little small marsupial, um, you know, I went online, had a look for what it was called and 
tried to find out as much as I could about it, but there was just nothing. It was just a brief description like you get in a, uh, a field book for birds. Uh, and that just got the ball rolling, you know, and then I had another sighting a few months later of it. And uh, I thought, well, the only way that I'm going to get good information on them is to actually sit, wait, watch for them to come in the spot where I originally saw them. And it just built from that uh, first two years, got nothing, <laughs> quick sightings of them going past me. Um, but then um, Melbourne Waters, which had a project in my reserve of cleaning up all the blackberries around the creek, that opened up a new area for me and bang, all of a sudden I'm surrounded by eight tiny little juvenile males that had just started their own communal nesting site. So I sat in that spot and I watched what happened to each individual one, soaking up everything. And I started to realize that, you know, this is what I was meant to do. I was meant to study the agile. I've always had this dream of making wildlife documentaries and things like that. And here it is in front of me. This is what I was supposed to do. So yeah, just sitting, watching, observing, not trying to interfere at all as least as I possibly could. I, I um, do put a little bit of honey out just to draw them out so that I can film them and study them a little better. And as they get used to me, um, and you know, over a period of two weeks or so, I'll start to drop that honey off uh, because I, I'm so aware that I'm, I'm interfering. <laughs> interfering in life but once that they understand and I'm not a threat and they accept you totally within a couple of weeks they totally accept me and I just sit observe they go about their lives and uh, I just started building up such an amazing knowledge of them but always wanting to know more from one little event I'd want to know the rest of that story that went along with that event. So it's, it's just been some things that um, become an addiction. Um, and I'm very grateful to the Agile for actually teaching me how to sit, observe, and uh, yeah, the. <laughs> I'm lost for words at the minute. It's just been an amazing experience. So I hope that um, watching and listening to my experience that that I can carry on to anyone out there. You know, that uh, just you just need to sit, watch, observe. You'll get a, a lot more out of wildlife and nature than just wandering through a reserve. If you're sitting, you're not being such a threat to animals and they pick up on this because you're lowering your stature. If you're standing watching, uh, yeah, birds especially pick up on this and they stay away from you a lot more. But if you sit calmly, you'll, you'll get one every now and then, a little bird will come and sit right next to you have a bit of a look around looking for insects and stuff and then fly off. So I, it, I really encourage that, that you just, even if you don't want to stop and sit somewhere for a long time, at least just stop, listen to nature, tune in as you walk through, you'll get a much better experience. That is for sure. Thank you so much uh, for that. And, and also just thank you for the beautiful videos that you've been happy to share with us. Um, it's, been, it's been lovely just seeing all the different beautiful little spots you've got of the creatures. And we've already had quite a few questions come in. So yeah, I'll just sort of get started mm -hmm. on those. And, and then if anyone else has got any other questions, please do put them in the Q&A box. We will try and get through as many as we can. If we don't get through them all today, we will uh, try and, you know, I'm happy to pass on, uh, you know, you can watch Derek's other videos on his YouTube channels and hopefully you'll get the answers from that. 
But the first question we had uh, that's been popular is how old on average do antichinus get? Well, the females are the ones that are left. Males only last uh, from when they're born to when the male dies is only around 11 months. And life is uh, fast and furious for them. They're the, first, they're the first to come out of the actual nest and explore the inside of the hollow tree that they're in. And they're the first to leave the uh, nesting hollow as well. So their biology is to uh, grow up much quicker because life is short. With females, uh, my experience in the forest and for little bits that I've read on that scientists, uh, little studies they've done, uh, that they don't live much longer than three years. Well, for me, I've come up against females that will go, they do go up to four years of age and then, I, then they disappear. Because as I stated about the nesting in a female will go to one site as long as, you know, for the most of her life. Um, that's enabled me to see when they stop, when they disappear. So four years of age is pretty regular to three. But I have footage and studied her as best I could. She was very shy. She's at least six years old. Wow. Now, how I've come to understand looking at a female, her age, that's come from uh, seeing a, a juvenile nesting the following year, you know, that next season. Um, seeing how her body changes to the next year and, you know, other females as well. So I just soaked up all this information about uh, instantly being able to see a new female. She's three years old. She'd have to be. The condition of their ears is crucial to that as well because they have ear mites um, and they slowly wear them down. Now this uh, female I called Rosie that or worn down really badly and her, the condition of her fur it just showed me that she was at least six years old um, I have one female that um, last year she disappeared and she, she was five years old because I saw her as a junior and she took up this nesting site and I followed her right through and that's at my favorite spot to stop 70 meters into the reserve so I could see her every now and then, even if I wasn't going to film her. That, that actually leads us. Thank you so much for that. That was a beautiful, detailed response. And we actually got another question that kind of leads into that from Gwyn, which is uh, that Gwyn had assumed that antichinus were nocturnal, but how much time do they actually spend in daylight? I'm glad you asked that one because uh, their description is that they're mainly a night dweller. They're not. There are two sleep times for them through the day, 10 till 2. So 10 a.m. till, 10 p uh, till 2 p.m. Um, is sleep time during the day, and it's exactly the same at night. Um, but uh, as all animals, that depends on their feeding uh, during that particular time of day or night. Uh, if they're really successful and they gorge themselves, they, they will come out later. So a little bit unpredictable still. But yeah, definitely, definitely over 10 years of studying them, I don't go out from, I'll drop off at maybe 11 o'clock if I'm going to film a, a nesting site, you know, at the base of it. I won't bother because that's what I've learned over the years. That those times are fairly regular. That's really interesting to know. Yeah, it's very different to what I think it mostly would have assumed. Um, yep. Another question that's really popular is how many young do they have in a litter? Six, but I believe that they eight. <laughs> eight teeth. Yeah, I'm yet to see this. So uh, the females that I've been studying have all um, you know, gone on. Uh, they're no longer here. So the next, this next generation, um, I'll be starting from scratch. So hopefully I'll come across it one day. Sure, we've got a question from Sue here that says, do you feel that acacia species generally would be their preferred habitat 
or is it just that silver wattles are dominant where you live? Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's because they're dominant in my the reserves that I go into. So in um, Yelling Bow, where the helmet and honey eater is, I was lucky enough to be invited in one time, have a little bit of a walk around. There was an, an agile uh, getting on top of the uh, feeding stations that they have for the helmet and honey eater. And following that around and just looking at that environment, it's totally different to mine. Totally different. To, they're, they're all mainly gum trees there. So they'll be going into um, whatever suits them in that area. The hollow of uh, living and dead trees. So they're not discriminatory. It's just <laughs> what um, is in that particular forested area. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Ian has asked a slightly different question. Can you please detail the artificial nest box design and mounting locations? For me, I just wanted it as natural as I could. So I, I actually, where I work, occasionally we have to cut some limbs off and things like that. So I'm always watching out for one that's um, about a metre long, uh, that has a reasonable hollow inside. And um, I put a base on that I can take off to clean it out for the next generation. Of, yeah. um, the, and the top, I'll um, make it so that I can put my trail camera in, so fiberglass it. And also my video camera has to be able to go on as well so I can use infrared things like that. Positioning wise, you have to know where the hotspots are where they like to nest. So the, the nesting box, my first one went to where um, I'd already showed you about where that female I called possum. She had her nest very close by, but it was, there was also the original tree that I started seeing females nesting in, I called um, Crossroads Hotel. It was near where the tr tracks all meet up and it got used by so many females. Also, as a female would finish nesting, it would become a communal nest year after year. And so I think I've answered that question. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, that's a great, that's good. And I think obviously there'll be some people wanting to see if they can build them in their own gardens, I'm sure, and going out into their own gardens to be a bit more observant as well. Yeah, I, look, I've, um, I've worked in people's houses up in Alinda. Uh, and I'm working away inside and Agile's come under the uh, fridge or something, you know, they've got a nest under there. Um, so they will come into your house uh, and they will go into barns and things like that. So you yeah, just be careful what, when you're putting rack sack and stuff out, that what you did see wasn't actually a mouse, it was an Agile Anticonus. <laughs> Which a is, good tip. That's a good thing to think about. It is because yeah, their fur is very similar colour, um, and they're easily mistaken at first glance. But if you take a second glance, if you're lucky enough, um, you'll see that the snout's longer, the ears. Yeah, just you just immediately go. Oh, hang on a minute, I'm on a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got another question here. What have you observed preying on the agile? Are there owls, snakes, or other mammals? I haven't witnessed this yet, um, except for one little event where a um, butcher bird landed beside me and I had an, an agile out on a little stage that I'd set up, so a branch for them to go up on. Um, and it sat there and spotted it. So there are so many things that want to eat them. <laughs> Um, yeah, all your predators want them. Suzanne asks, how long on average do you spend in your reserve watching wildlife each week? Not as much as I used to. When I first started, uh, for the first eight years of studying the Agile, I'd spend 30 or more hours a week. So it's, I'd come straight home from work, have something eat and drink, bang, straight out the bush for three hours every night. Um, I just become so dedicated and um, obsessed <laughs> with learning. And then on the weekends, I'd spend three to four hours in the morning 
in three to four hours in the afternoon, which I still do now. Saturdays is probably my main days now. So yeah, a lot of hours. Um, and as you learn and understand, like we've discussed with the time, that drops away. You're not wasting as much time sitting there waiting. <laughs> there you go. And that leads us into the next question, really, about uh, what you've observed over your time. So Sue wanted to know, has the timing of the breeding season altered over the time you have been observing the Antipinus? Yes. Let's come, come back to the silver wattle. Uh, whenever that flowers, it, that changes a lot over the year. So I've seen it flower in May. Um, but... A lot of times, you know, uh, June, July at the start of July, towards the end of July, the start of you know, the start of August. It's mainly been within that time frame. So I'd say at um, as a regular thing, it'd be the middle of uh, July is the breeding season for the agile. Whereas online, uh, well, of course, yeah, you have to have some sort of uh, thing to have as an average they will they all say all the websites say august but it does change all nature changes with the signaling of events and for me the silver wattle announces it for a lot of birds and animals uh, the ringtail possums one of you know i notice a lot of things i'm sitting there for so much time there's a lot that goes on around me. I see a massive amount. So yes, um, and I'll just add to that about the flowering. Whenever you see a plant flowering, there's an event going on. You just need to connect it up with something. Uh, for an example, with um, the tea tree, when they're flowering, I know without listening or hearing uh, the that the white-eared honey eater. I know that they're breeding because the tea tree are flowering. It just announces these different events. That's beautiful. I love that. You really learn the whole sort of life cycle and the connection of everything together. Yes, um, it, and it, 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 the res, reserve is teaching me about how it connects with everything. So without the trees and the plants, you're not going to have as much in that an area like that. So having such a diversity of large trees and plants um, just you know, helps the reserve to draw in animals. And yeah, you just get that amazing um, diversity. And that's a really good point to make that, you know, it's something we can actually do to actively look after all our native uh, animals is to, you know, look, plant different native trees and flowers and grasses and things, habitat, food, all sorts of things. So I know yes. that the reserve you work in there actually is an environmental volunteer group that are there who have been doing a lot of that work. So it's really fantastic that it's obviously making such a wonderful benefit and an impact and into the life. It has. It, um, it's, it's ongoing at the minute. Uh, just a lot of work going on in there and um, I'm always keen to jump in because um, I've gotten so much out of it. Always trying to give back. Uh, and one of my, I'll just add to that, that uh, one of my things that I, I take on to help look after the reserve is those bloody European wasps. <laughs> um, I've got two big nests in there. I'm just waiting for the temperature to drop a lot more because they're huge. Um, I didn't know they were there, probably because of COVID last year, I missed out um, on seeing those sort of things, but uh, there's two huge ones here. So I like to get rid of them. I've built up a lot of techniques in getting rid of them safely without using, without using uh, too, too much uh, chemical to interfere with the other insects. So, that's great. Well, yeah, it's good. always good to do what we can to look after our native wildlife. And I'm just going to get back to the questions. So I'm aware of time. So Joanne I had a question that actually I was really interested in as well. How do you recognise the individuals? Oh, they're full of character. 
I can I can see one coming in the distance, say 15 metres away, and I'll know exactly who it is. They've all got names. Once they come up to you, you can confirm it. So, um, but yeah, body language, um, the way they present themselves to you, you can see who they are. Uh, the more aggressive ones um, are very distinctive. So, uh, but also once they turn up uh, suddenly, I'll instantly say, okay, that's got a nick out of its ear. Females, they because they live them so long. Um, I had one female little be in my documentary. I'll just throw that in. Uh, uh, called Nikki for obvious reasons. One of her ears had quite a lot of little nicks in it. So there's all those little things. And uh, one of the things that will that'll be highlighted in my uh, documentary a bit uh, about identifying them is um, the colour variations in the fur. So there's three, four major colours there. Some are grey with uh, burnt orange undertones and others are just grey. Some have beige bellies, but mainly they have white bellies. So the female I called Sandy in that little presentation, she had a, a very beige belly. Um, some have that burnt orange as a patch on their sides. Yeah, so there's just this mixture of grey, white, uh, beige, and then this burnt orange. And you occasionally, uh, or Dave, that I mentioned in the video, in my presentation, he was just all burnt orange, very standoutish from the crowd. So, so there, there you go, that, that's how I can distinguish character and the colour of the fur and any other sort of marking with their ears, things like that. So again, I guess it's a lot about uh, being very observant and taking, being patient and getting to know your little area. It is, it is. And uh, I get very attached to them. And um, no, I don't want to go up and cuddle them. I don't want them to come up to me and I, I'm just, they accept me, totally accept me. And when I withdraw that honey, especially the females, they will come up to me and go, hey, I know it's you that's putting it out. Can you put some out for me? I'm, I like it, you know. Um, but the good thing I like about with, with the agile and putting that little bit of honey out is they don't gorge themselves on it. It's just a little bit of a taste. They really like it and they, then they're off on the out hunting. They'll come back on their way back into the nest and have a, have a little suck and then they're off. So, I, yeah, I'm not influencing their diet. Much <laughs> no, I trust it. you, don't worry. <laughs> Oh, no, I'm just sort of saying that as uh, how I feel about it. That, yep. uh, and it could be a question there, but I suppose that, um, how much Absolutely. am I influencing them to uh, you know, have spend time with me? Well, yeah, we'll get back to the questions, actually. And I will just remind people, if there's another question that you really like the look of, please do give the thumbs up, because that's pretty much how I'm running off at the moment. So I'm just taking the ones that have the likes and the thumbs up from others. So uh, the most popular ones are getting asked first. Um, so we had another question here that uh, they wanted to check that if they are not agiles are marsupials but without a pouch, and how developed are the young at birth? Well, they're just like kangaroos. They're they're a little bean. They're um, you know, like a worm. They have to do the same thing to find the teeth. Uh, their mother carry their young for only around five weeks. Some will drop off early, and some will hang on a little bit. Um, which is better for me, I'll get a little bit of footage because you can't see them unless she lifts her leg to scratch herself. Uh, and that annoys the crap out of me that I can't get footage or photographs of that. I'll sit there and wait and hopefully she scratches, you know. Um, but it, as far as it, it, they're an open pouch. So uh, for the first two weeks, she holds them very tight at uh, a flap of skin. So it is pretty well much um, a full pouch, you know, that they, they can't hang out and they, they really looked after nicely. Um, and then as they grow it, that sort of gets relaxed a little bit more. Um, I have footage of one female that hanged on to a young for an extra uh, four days and 
I got a tiny little bit of footage, a tiny little bit worth a million dollars to me. Um, great big bulging babies, hairless, just eyes, little tiny limbs. Um, she squished through a tiny little opening in this log. And it was just amazing. I thought, oh, she's going to lose all the young. And she managed to keep them. Um, so as far as a pouch goes, it opened. But they still have good control, like any kangaroo wallaby, of uh, tightening when they need to. Just squish them down so they can get through tight places. Um, Oh, yeah. Cool, I'll move on to the next question then because we're still getting loads coming through. Um, so Alan wants to know, can, anti can an antichinus be differentiated from a mouse by its scapped shape? Yeah, uh, yes. With my nesting boxes, I've found that the Agile like to use them as toilets. Right? They like a little ledge or something to go to because they're like us. They don't want to go out in the cold just to go to the toilet. And they seem to go to the toilet about oh, once every hour or so. It's a hell of a lot more mustier smell than you get with a mouse. It's distinguishable. It's, it's sweeter, a sweeter smell. It hits me when I open that lid on the nesting boxes. You can't miss it. Uh, and uh, they can be sort of stuck together in a line as well. They're dark black. It where yeah, mice are more in a little bit more pellet sort of style. These are just a little bit more longer, much blacker, darker. Cool, thanks. Um, another question, have you noticed the Agile contend with any bird or mammal species for nesting sites? All right, so my nesting box was interrupted, uh, ruining my studying of, of um, possum, my first nesting box. Uh, so she was coming into a fourth year and she built the nest that re-established the nesting site and everything was going to look great. I come on a Saturday morning, open the lid, there's sugar gliders taking it over. Um, so I thought, oh well, let's have to take advantage of this. I'm not going to kick them out. And they stayed there for a good 12 months. Had some young, raised them, and um, I learned a bit. Well, that actually leads us into another question from Suzanne uh, about what other animals do you study in your in the reserve? Nothing goes past me. Put it that way. I observe everything that goes on. Um, I love uh, how when I first started getting the agile regularly, especially with the site with the males with Arnie, I'd constantly have the native rodent, the native bush rat. Um, I prefer to call them the bogle. That's uh, uh, first Australians um, in Sydney. That's what they called them. I don't know what a, what their name is down here, but I've adopted the bogle. Um, they'd constantly come up. The Agile would try and take them on, uh, as the Agile does. It uh, will try and scare them off. And uh, they take no notice of them. They don't care about the agile. It's just one little nip and you're dead. You know? uh, and the native rodent, the swamp rat as well. Same attitude, um, which I, I'll just add. I, I don't know why they called them swamp rat. I really don't. They don't particularly live in swamps. They, they live all over. Uh, you go out to Yarra Glen there on... Um, cow paddocks out there there's just tons of um but they're more like a guinea pig with a short tail they're identical sort of sounding their behavior so i observing all these things with the uh, possum there's a, a resident there's a brown scrub wren that's become quite used to me now over the years will come up sit wait for the agile to, to stop licking the honey and then comes in and has a little bit himself, the, the male. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of interaction because I put that honey out um, with other animals and stuff like that. So the Agile don't care about the little birds. They don't, they're very much aware and <laughs> worried about 
the larger animals. Birds going past flying over, it scares the crap out of them and they'll drop off. That typical agile fashion, they're straight back. Uh, birds, I'll just add that birds especially uh, like the grey thrush will dive bomb them and kill them. Not to eat because it's not their diet, but they will attack them. And I found that even with the little uh, superb blue wren. They will attack them too because they know this has all come from observing again. Uh, they know they'll get into and raid their nests, which has led me into another question. <laughs> but uh, yes, the agile actively hunt out nesting birds to eat their chicks. Wow. And I filmed that too. Wow, you've got must have a lot of interesting footage. <laughs> uh, there's about nine terabytes. <laughs> so that's quite a lot then. Um, we, had a, yep. we had a quick question here from Sharon. She wanted to clarify, do they, did you say they eat the fruit? Uh, she was asking that because uh, she wasn't sure if it was a rat or an antipinus eating her apples. <laughs> so she just wanted to check. I'd say it's a rat. Okay. Um, I've done different types of tests with putting worms out, putting different, you know, a little bit of tuna. Um, I just tried a few things to see what they would take and whether they see whether they would, um, uh, you know, eat something that's died, you know, say a rabbit or something like that. Would, would they scavenge off that? So what I found is they don't eat fruit. They just can't get enough of uh, the beetles and moss. And like I said, those um, witchy grubs, uh, if a, a wattle tree falls to the ground, that's when they're more ex accessible. Um, I've just witnessed them going nuts on them <laughs> without a camera in my hand. <laughs> it's not very frustrating for you, I'm sure. Yes, it was. Um, do you know how common they are within the uh, ranges? Extremely common. But uh, when you're walking through a reserve, now I walked through my reserve for over 20 years before I finally had one jump out in front of me. Um, so you're not going to see them do that very often. Um, the best time to see agiles climbing trees, looking for insects, is uh, December through to Mar uh, March. Um, that's the juveniles you'll see more of. Females are very active at that stage, um, the older females. Uh, a little bit more from September they'll start doing a little, but you won't see them much. So when you're walking through a reserve, um, just keep your eyes out. That's all I can say. But in those months, you're more likely to see them. That's a great tip. Thank you very much for that. I'll be looking forward to Christmas. Uh, that's what I'll be doing. Uh, we have a question from Liz here. That she says their sounds are so interesting. Do you know about their variations or the meanings? No. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, they they have like a bat sound, the natty, net, 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 net sort of sound. Uh, I had a nest that was in this uh, hollow opening. I put a ladder up so that I could be on the same level as the nest, and uh, I disturbed the joeys. They were just a little bit too young to be coming out of the nest, but they panicked and came out because the nest was so close to the, you know, the entrance or part of the entrance. Um, and uh, one fell to the ground and I picked it up to put it back in. And it just, na, 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 yeah. um, Otherwise you listen to them in the nesting boxes. Uh, I'll put my video camera on and I'll have my ear pieces in and I'll be headphones in and I'll be listening in um, that way as well. Um, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you can't come into the nest. You go up the top, like I discussed before. So there's very aggressive, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, just that, but with the little bit that I've got of the males uh, reacting with a female um, as far as the mating, Okay, so I showed that little bit of footage. There was some very soft tones. 
yeah, very uh, loving, soft little tones going on there. So. Oh, that's beautiful. That's very cute. Um, we had a question from Lisa here. How do you tell if it's a dusky or an agile antiphonus? Uh, size. Oh. Uh, duskies are much bigger. Um, what would they be? Possibly about five times bigger, six times bigger. Um, they're high on my radar every time I'm sitting down. If you get side, I get a siding of one run past. They never stop. They don't care about any food I put out for them just to stop so I can study with you. Um, so yeah, distinguishing between the two, they're the ones you'll see run across the track. You won't, it's very rare that I see the agile run across tracks. They seem to stay away from open spaces as much as they can. With a dusky, um, always running cross trails. They're the ones you'll see dead on the track. Uh, the males, that is. Uh, I've only occasionally come across uh, the agile that died, and that's on the tracks. That's mainly from uh, a bird attack. Yeah. All right, excellent. Well, that's good. Yeah, like, thank you for that. That's useful to know. Um, Ian wants to know, how easy is it to pick a male and a female apart from a distance? Um, from a distance, it's not always that easy to tell. Uh, the, the males are substantially bigger, as a rule. You know, the, I've had one that was the same size as a female. Very feisty, very dominant, um, but their tail is thicker. That's the best way to pick up whether it's a male is you'll see, if you see it's got a very thick tail, that's a, a quick observation. Uh, very quickly pick up the, the male. Uh, they have a bit more bulkier look about them as well. Not, not muscly, but just a little bit um, thicker in the coat or sort of a look. You know? Cool, that sort of leads us into the next question from Sue. Do you find individuals color changes during lifetimes? No, no, just uh, with um, Rosie being around that six years of age, her, she'd lost a lot of fur, very patchy. Um, and I, yeah, I'd like, I would have liked to have seen her when she was younger to you know, be able to answer that question 100%. Uh, no, I think their, their fur would definitely maybe just darken a little bit, maybe. So I don't think there'd be a lot of change. It's just the condition of it would change. Excellent. Um, we're just sort of coming up to our last few questions here. So if anyone's got any others they want, sort of now's the time to put them in. Um, someone asked here, is, is the mating and breeding at the same time each year, or is it specifically dependent on conditions of rain, food availability, things like that? Uh, yeah, that goes back to the question that we answered earlier. Um, it's, it's timing of uh, what the temperature is at, you know, um, moving, shifting uh, the months. Yeah, even though we have it timed exactly, the months, uh, nature doesn't do that. They go with the conditions that they're given with each year. So it'll move forward, it'll move backwards. It, there's no set time you can't just say right july they're going to breed you may have already missed it i've done it many a time as i first started i took two weeks off and they started breeding at the end of those two weeks you know so um, there's two weeks off to purposely study mating behavior because i was getting not frustrated but i really wanted to observe it so no it moves it's just nature it moves with um, how the conditions are going to be. Are we having a dry year? Are we having a wet year? Or are we having an, a, a perfect year? Perfect year, everything will start exactly as it normally should be. You know. <laughs> and uh, Troy wants to know, do they ever enter suburbia or, they are, or are they averse to that sort of disturbance? Uh, look, I think the more forests they've got, the more likely they are to be. Uh, once you start... I've never heard of them being any further than uh, down, you know, maybe at the bottom of Ferntree Gully there, just to start near Train Bridge and places like that. Once you start moving down a bit further, I, I doubt it. Uh, they'd be eaten. 
cats, foxes. <laughs> this it just wouldn't suit them. I don't think. No, that sounds that sounds fair enough. Much nicer to be up here in the beautiful Yarra Ranges in our bushlands. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> up with me, come visit me every now and then. <laughs> Absolutely. And on that note, Robin asks, uh, do antichinus live in holes in the ground? Uh, they've seen an antichinus in the garden, but they've also seen holes in the ground and wondered if those two things were connected. I doubt it. Um, not actually a hole in the ground. Uh, the dusky will do, though. They'll use abandoned sort of holes like that. Um, I've had one where I found it nesting uh, in a uh, where a stump had rotted away and it was just the, the root and it had gone down inside the root uh, and the same with a uh, fallen tree there's one that regularly goes into the, the root ball of um, but but not the agile um, if you've got uh, a lot of rocks like the outcrop or something like that and there's no real hollow for them to go and nest in they'll go in there and make a nest but they for my observations, they much prefer hollows because the the joeys can uh, grow and build up their strength in safety in a hollow. Yeah, um, that's why I build those nesting boxes uh, a meter long, so they got plenty of room to uh, explore, build up their strength. So it it look there's always the exception to the rule. Animals are like that. Um, so I don't totally discard it, but as a general rule, I would say no. That's absolutely fair enough. And uh, yeah, I do agree that animals, particularly Australian animals, I've noticed, do not follow the rules in the rule book. Um, so a couple more questions and then we'll sort of start wrapping up. But thank you so much for this, Sarah. It's been absolutely fascinating. I've really loved it. Um, I think everyone else has from the comments as well. A uh, couple of questions. So Gay wants to know, can you explain the life cycle of the Agile Antipinus? Juvenile, the joeys are born around mid-September, you know, around that time. Uh, then mum carries them around for five weeks in her pouch. And then they start coming out of their nests and they start exploring and gaining their strength uh, around November. Then towards the middle and the end of uh, December, they're coming out. Their mother will push them out by not turning up. Just one day, she decides, right, they're ready. And she won't come back. She'll come back late at night. Um, this forces them to come out. They're starving by afternoon, which will be a story in my documentary. <laughs> they're absolutely starving by the afternoon. And very brave, they'll start coming out, come down the uh, tree that they live in a little bit at a time, and then they gain their confidence. So uh, males go into their own communal nesting site very soon after, yeah, within a week or two of them coming out of the nesting hole and getting their own food. Uh, females will linger. They generally like, they stay in the home nesting site. Other females join them, other juveniles. And then they'll disperse off um, later on, probably. Uh, then we we come back to that that cycle again um, of males, their breeding behaviour, uh, and it annoys me when you hear uh, little documentaries on their. The, and uh, if I hear from you know people say to me, uh, the males, you know themselves to death uh, but it's not that at all it's chemicals in their body push them to mate there's no time to waste they have to because their bodies are going to give out yeah so um that's that's the cycle thank you for that that was really interesting and really good to know um last couple of questions uh, approximately how many antichinus are in your reserve i can only guesstimate there's, um, I don't, I try not to waste too much time. Uh, it's too hard to try and go around counting. Maybe one day I'll 
do it purposely, but otherwise um, it's just a little awkward. I'm still studying, still secrets I want to know. So it makes me stay in one spot more than anything. But the spots that I know, and I'm just at a guesstimation, that the height of when all the joeys come out of their nesting sites, possibly up to 100. Now the reserve that I uh, study in is somewhere around 40 acres. It just seems that that could be a reasonable number to say. And by the time you get to breeding season, I'd be lucky to be half. Because, wow. Because you, you could lose 30% to 20% um, from the time the joeys come out of the nest um, up until two to three months down the track. And that's just from maybe natural causes, but being picked off, especially males, they take no notice of what's going on around them. All they care about is getting food. So as they're climbing trees and I'm looking at them, I'm thinking, there's a kookaburra right here. And they're taking no notice of him. Excellent. Okay, we're down to the last couple of questions. So Jeanette wants to know, can you talk more about differentiating between antiphinus and rats and mice? So the, the agile's behavior is, uh, yeah, is quite substantially different. Where, uh, you know, a mouse scampers around the place and it's very sneaky. Uh, agile's a little bit more, a little bit more out there. They'll, they hang around a little bit, um, checking things out. Their ooze um, confidence as well, where a mouse scampers around it, wants to be, doesn't want to be seen. It's hidden. Yeah, it's the best I can sort of say without it be more uh, easy for me to, to show rather than um, explain. I think it's just a little hard. It's Maybe we'll need to get you back for another a webinar about the difference between rice, mouse, and anti uh, rice, mice, rats, and antichinus. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's definitely a difference in their in their body shapes. Um, long snout, razor sharp teeth. So you can see instantly, as I did when I first had this one jump out in front of me for the first time. Um, had no idea what it was. I instantly saw that it was an insect eater because of its long snout. So the the ears are different. They're more bat like. If we're looking at um, explaining uh, the differences between uh, physically. Um, yeah, uh, where a mouse, you sort of always look at them and they look small. And that job doesn't, it gives you a bit more look of uh, a little bit bigger size and more confidence about itself. That's a great answer. Thank you so much. Um, someone asked, the video that we had at the very start, how long a period does that video represent? I guess how long, uh, how many days of filming and things was that? I presume it was, wasn't all in one <laughs> shot. <laughs> Years, years. Um, you don't just sit down every day and get something. I'll turn up, sit down, get myself ready. Agile finally come out of its nesting hollow and nick off. It won't go near the honey. It won't come and say hello to me. It's gone. Um, the next day, man, there's this magic happening. It's doing stuff that I haven't seen it do before. And, um, things like that. There, I've, I've always thought about this as I walk through the reserve, um, not just with the agile, but birds and other animals in general. It seems like one in a hundred is fantastic. A uh, hundred walks, I should say. Um, one in 50, I'll get something beautiful. And the rest of the time, I'm just getting average everyday sort of stuff <laughs> so it it is not uh, for me i'm not a very patient man but i'm very persistent and um, i've learned to even when you're starting to get a little bored a little switched off to reconnect back with nature focus on you know to, when something happening so i'm ready for it so Answering that question in a nutshell, man, you've got to spend a lot of hours, a, <laughs> well, lot, a lot to get one little tiny clip. Well, it was definitely worth it because the video footage you had was absolutely beautiful. Um, we got last two questions. I keep thinking of the last two and then someone else puts a question up. So Matt wants to know what size do you think uh, the female's territory is? 
Oh, I'd love to know that. If anyone out there knows where I can get my hands on a tiny little setup that I can track them. So satellite tracking. Um, I know people have done it with spiders, uh, but um, I haven't been able to find enough any information about that. It'd be awesome. I can only go off what I see. They uh, following them, I tend to lose them after about a 30 metre distance. They would cover a lot more area than that. So if you look at a circle around where they're nesting, it would be like a 60 metre through, you know, from 30 metres out that way, 30 metres out that way. Um, but that's at a guess. It's probably a lot bigger than that. I have had, um, I was filming the males and I had a female turn up who was 70 metres um, away where she lives and she just suddenly turned up. So that just sort of gave you that, yeah. It, it's, it could be much further than that, but without tracking, it's hard. <laughs> Very tricky for you to find out. Yeah. Okay. And our last question, this is a lovely opportunity for you to promote yourself really. So Paulie wants to know if you have any books available but I also know this is an opportunity absolutely to talk about your documentary coming up. But please talk about anything you'd like to promote now. <laughs> all right. OK, so um, I had all this information in my head and it had to go somewhere quickly. So uh, I thought I'd write some books, self-published books. And um, I was given um, a company to go to from uh, uh, John Hill's Landcare Group, um, Julie. And that, so without, oh, that's better, <laughs> like getting on it. Uh, Agile Anticonist Life as a Female. So the female side of the story and um, one on the males. Now I do have to do one on the females. Um, oh, sorry. Oh, I hate this. The juvenile side of the story, but um, I've just been in very involved in making a lifelong dream come true and that's having making a documentary um so that's sort of the next thing to promote i guess uh i've it's something i've been working on as i've been studying the agile because uh, you know once i'd started finding them and and understanding that i could regularly um get good information i thought this is it this this is, it's my time now to make a documentary because i have subject that no one cares about too much so i um so i've embarked on that but it's based around the reserve so how precious reserves are no matter what size they are how thinly covered they are they are so important so it's based around that in, in three episodes uh, so the first one is on the agile of course and how it whoops, interacts with its environment as well as everything else that we've discussed. Uh, cramming it into a 45 to 50 minute thing is going to be awkward for me. Um, and then the next one's on birds and animals in the reserve. Well, with the occasional reference to the Agile. Uh, and then it's on the reserve itself on the plants. And uh, like we've talked about um, how different events are marked by different plants flowering and things like that. And using YouTube as a vehicle for my apprenticeship, if you like, for making a wildlife documentary. Um, so with my subscribers on there, I asked if they could help me out uh, by going to a website called Buy Me A Coffee. <laughs> I thought it was an awesome thing. You, know, you could donate as much as you like, buy me one coffee, two coffees. So that's, uh, if anyone would like to be part of this documentary. I it does explain a few things uh, on there, and there's also a link on my uh, YouTube channel. I made a little video explaining it as well about um, what I'm doing with the documentary and how to buy me a coffee. But if you go to um, Google, type in "buy me a coffee," go to that website, type in my name, Derek Hilton, um, and just have a look. You don't have to buy me a coffee, but you know something you're interested in being part of uh, this beautiful project go for it and i will say to everyone that the link to your youtube channel will be in the follow-up email we'll be sending out early next week so 
I do really highly recommend everyone goes and have a look at that. It's you've got some amazing footage of so many different creatures and just beautiful shots. So I really do recommend it. And I, I do hope that other people do go out and buy your coffee as well, because I'm very much looking forward to seeing this documentary. And just quickly, where can people buy the book and where are you hoping that the documentary will, will be shown? Um, all right. So it's for the books. It's book right. I haven't really done much with this. It's just something I had to get down on paper. Um, so at the minute, um, yeah, so you go to Book right and you just type my name in um, and it should come up. You could tag um, Agile Antikinus on it as well, but I think it'd probably more likely come up with my name. That's as best as I can do for you at the minute. Eventually I will have a website where all these things would be much more available, but that's still in the future. Um, right, so the documentary I am aiming at, at television. Um, look, I'm giving it a go. Who knows whether anyone would be interested in it, but it's happening, it has to. It's just something I've dreamt of as a, an eight-year-old. So it, I... And I have the means, I have the footage, I have the knowledge, so I'm making it. <laughs> That's where it's aimed at. It's aimed at television, and we'll just see where it goes from there. Well, I wish you huge luck with it, Derek. You are a fountain of knowledge, and you've got so much passion, and people are commenting, they're loving your work and loving your passion and the amount of knowledge you have. And obviously, we really, you've spent so many hours in your reserve. I do hope it all pays off for you. And I hope that everyone else gets to see the beauty that you get to live amongst all the time and get to enjoy on a daily basis. So thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for taking time out and putting that video together of all the many hours that you spent. Um, is there anything else you'd like to sort of say or promote or kind of uh, wrap up for, for our webinar today? <laughs> I'd just like to thank everybody that's watching and, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about my passion. Don't get to do it very often. Um, yeah, uh, being able to talk about them, it's a good release for me. So thank you very much for the opportunity. And look forward to um, seeing and working with the Shire in the future. Um, I, um, I love talking about the Agile, so you've only got to ask me. <laughs> I'll be right we will, there. We will definitely get you back in some form, Derek. We have really loved you having you today. So thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for joining us this morning. And uh, we're going to wrap it up there, give you all time to now go out and go to your local reserve and go and sit and just observe and enjoy. So uh, it's not raining, go and enjoy that sunshine. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Derek. Bye. Bye, all.